recordings in progress. And I'm really happy to introduce Pat and Erin. Uh, I'll let you take it from here, Pat and Erin. Okay, I will just share my screen here. See if this works. All I have to do is find. Oh. Oh. We need to go back to the beginning, and here we are. Hey, Erin, take her away. You're on mute. Oh, rough start. Welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for having us. Really looking forward to chatting with everybody today. And we're going to try to keep the didactic stuff um, really brief, um, knowing that lots of Lots of that stuff, the stuff that you already know. So it's just here as a reminder. Um, but hoping to have some good conversation. And then um, thank you, Rebecca, for the land acknowledgement. Um, I will add that Pat was born in the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq as well. Um, but she and I have both spent most of our uh, certainly our working lives, Pat also her whole life, on Treaty 13 territory, myself in Toronto and Pat in Mississauga. Um, and uh, yeah, may we all work in solidarity um, with people who experience violence related to colonialism um, and keep that central to our work. So I am Pat Coots. Uh, I have been uh, a nurse for a significant number of years. I uh, have spent the last 30 plus years working in chronic wound care. I've had experience in medicine, surgery, psychiatry, um, worked in the first premenstrual syndrome clinic in Canada, which was interesting. Uh, and I uh, have really enjoyed working in chronic wounds and really uh, working with people that have chronic wounds and uh, really enjoy teaching and the communication aspect and always, always learning. And um, I think probably, Erin, I kind of coerced you into wound care, would you say? That absolutely coerced me into wound care. So my name is Erin. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I work at the Moss Park uh, Consumption and Treatment Service. Um, and uh, But I've been doing wound care since basically I was like 20 years old. Um, that's when I got involved with Wounds Canada um, by Pat's kind of goading. And I, I did some like research assistant stuff with them for a while. Um, so yeah, I come by the wound care interest, honestly. Um, I do also work at the Wound Healing Center at Women's College Hospital. Um, and definitely, um, it's one of my more favorite parts of my practice. So happy to be here with other people who enjoy wound care um, and want to talk about it. And and in essence of full disclosure, Erin, people need to know that we're related. Erin is, is my niece. Is <laughs> yeah. Yes, I am a wound care at Nepo Baby. I'm going to add this to my to my signature on my emails. So, oh, sorry, Erin. Go ahead. And I'm just reading where everyone's from, and I'm really excited. Okay, so we're just going to talk a little bit about chronic versus acute wounds. Discuss wound bed preparation paradigm because that's always a good foundation. Talk about the etiology of chronic wounds. Um, describe wounds and infection. Discuss wound assessment local wound care and explore some tools and resources because there are some new things happening that are very cool um, and have a discussion. So please feel free to chime in at any time if you want to add something, want to say something you're seeing, something that's been working for you, something that's been a challenge. Um, my favorite part of, of these kinds of things is just hearing from other people. So um, yeah, please, please speak up. So uh, just as a review, um, all wounds, be they chronic or acute, go through the four phases of healing. You get the hemostasis, which is the clotting, and that's the immediate response, the inflammation that lasts from zero to four days, the proliferation phase where the new uh, cells are being 
uh, the new epithelium is being formed. And that can de depend on the size of the wounds, take anywhere from four to 21 days. And then uh, it can take with a chronic wound up to two years for that area to gain 80% of the tensile strength that it had before it was wounded. So when you have a chronic wound that's been there for quite a length of time, uh, it has a, a very significant chance of being re-injured. And I think this distinction between acute versus chronic wounds is um, a good one for us to be mindful of, because I think a lot of the wounds that I see, for instance, um, in the CTS setting or in the, you know, that's the Ontario word for like a safe infection site, um, are, are acute wounds. They're largely acute wounds. And there's different factors that will make these wounds at risk for becoming chronic wounds. Um, so an acute wound um, is like a skin break um, and it becomes a chronic wound when it fails to progress through that orderly sequence of repair. Um, and I think we certainly do see a lot of those as well, but primarily acute wounds. Um, and the next slide. So one of the approaches that has been used in the uh, chronic wound care community is the wound bed preparation paradigm. It was recently, it's been around uh, since the um, er, mid to late 90s. Uh, and it was um, come, it came about with a group of uh, wound leaders, chronic wound care leaders, of trying to figure out how to, the best approach for chronic wounds. This one was revised in uh, 2021 by uh, Dr. Gary Sibold and all. And uh, you can actually get it through the um, woundcarejournal.com. You can see the um, citation at the bottom, but it does look at 10 segments of looking after a person with a chronic wound. And you can see it goes from a person at risk or with a chronic wound through identifying the cause, looking at the person themselves and their family and the concerns. You need to determine whether that wound will heal, whether it won't heal for varying reasons or well, whether it's non-healing or palliative. And then look at the local wound care, but it comprises of um, debriding the necrotic tissue if it needs to happen, uh, managing the infection and or the inflammation, looking at the appropriate moisture management, which is your local wound care, determining if that wound is on a healing trajectory, if it's able to heal, what the wound edge is doing. And one of the things that we need to consider is that system within which we're working. So those are the 10 pieces that you want to look at. Okay, and now want to open up to folks. So here, we're not trying to solve any problems. We're just trying to describe what we're looking at. So if folks can put in the chat, tell me, what do you see going on here? What more do you wanna know? And what kind of things would you think about when you're trying to determine what the etiology of this wound is? Come on in the chat. Help us out. What do you okay. see? Erin, you need to monitor the chat because I- I'm watching. Yeah. Okay. Anybody see anything other than yuck? Unmute yourself or put it in the chat. I see that Kiana is on the call. Hello. Myself, Riverdale call. Okay, so um, thank you. Thank you so much, Harold. When did it start? Is it getting worse or better? Yeah, these are very important questions and a really good place to start. What was the Initial injury. How long has the wound been here? Concerned about redness. Um, Kathy, yeah. In what way are you concerned about the redness? What about the redness is concerning? 
And someone could answer for Kathy, but Kathy, if oh. you want to unmute and talk, please do. Yeah, I can put my video on. I'm at work right now. Um, I mean, just the irregular border too um, is concerning. Like, it looks like the edges are uneven. Um, like to me, it looks like it's more systemic infection possible. Uh, okay. What makes you think systemic infection? What are the well, red, signs? Like the redness. It's hard okay. to tell if there's swelling from the picture. I don't know what is it. Yeah, it's, it's all good. It's all good. Yeah. Yeah. What part of the body is it? Yeah. Um, and I think, I think that one we can answer that it's a lower leg, I believe, right, Pat? Yes, it is. Uh, what was the initial injury? How long has the wound been there? Oh, sorry, going back. Yes, we are concerned about the redness. How did this happen? What's the medical history? Concerned about the dryness and fragility of the skin surrounding the wound. Um, in brackets, impaired skin integrity question. And then what is going underneath the, the soft crust? Yes, has this ever been divided? Great questions. How has the person been treating it? Is there drainage from the wound and is it clear or is it purulent? For that, Erin, you can see what's on the towel there underneath the leg. Yeah, that gives us a clue. It's always nice to see the old dressing too, right? Like the dressing that was taken off, that can be a really good source of information. And hi, Oman, welcome. Do we have any thoughts about the etiology? If, if someone had to put in a guess. And Priya in particular, don't answer. Oh, I was really just gonna answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I in particular know that you have a lot of knowledge about chronic wounds and there may be other folks on this, on this webinar who do as well, but I wanna give folks an opportunity. Any ideas? So you know it's on the leg. You know that the borders are irregular. You know that there's redness around. Unfortunately, you can't see how far the redness extends, uh, but there is redness around the wound. It does look like it has more of a serous uh, drainage or exudate then it does have um, a serosanguinous or a sanguinous exudate. And Pat, would you consider any of that wound bed necrotic? It's hard to tell from the picture. It's hard to tell whether that's hard or soft. Um, mm. But from what you're seeing here, it looks like it is um, either a scab which is hard necrotic tissue or whether it's soft necrotic tissue, but it that's a good possibility. And then we've got, could it be a burn? So there's two people who are wondering if it's a burn. And we're not gonna answer it here. We're gonna answer it later. So Priya, hold on to your suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you first crack at it too, Priya, when we get to it. Hey, we moving on to the next slide then? Yeah. So all of this is kind of talking about assessment and um, assessment is so important and assessment is really important in teams um, that um, we have a common language for things <laughs> and that's where we're describing things in a way that other practitioners are also gonna be able to understand it so that we can track progress and so we, we can know what we're talking about. But we always, we're always like looking at the wound, like the wound is the focus of attention. And, you know, of course we have to also like step back and think about the person, not just the, not, we need to think about not the whole in the person, we need to think about the whole person. Is that what, is that what Gary says? That, um, that's correct. Yep. Yeah. So we need to think about medical history. Medical history is really important. Are there 
factors going on in the person's immune system, in um, other chronic conditions they have that might predispose them to wounds or to certain types of wounds. What's the social environmental history? Like what's their access to sleep, to food, to, um, to places to wash up? Um, what's the history of the wound? And the comments were so good at getting at that piece, like how long has it been there? Um, and what's the course been for this wound? What's the underlying cause of the wound? Because if you go back to the wound pad preparation paradigm, you really have to treat the cause and then everything else comes from that. Um, what's the extent of in injury? The wound healing status and the wound characteristics, which we have all just practiced describing for each other um, using some really good, clear language. One of Next. the uh, tips that I've learned or tricks that I've learned over the years is um, when, when you're asking for history, I, it depends on who's asking the question because the individual will tell a nurse one thing, um, a social worker, some, another little bit of information, a, uh, an occupational therapist, another piece of information, a physician, another piece of information, um, because they, they tend to share information that they think that particular individual wants to know mm -hmm. by looking at the medication history you will get a far better insight into what that medical history is because if you ask somebody if they have hypertension they will say oh no it, it's fine but when you look at the medication history they are they are on an antihypertensive that is giving them very good control of their their blood pressure. So of course it's fine. So by asking to see that list of medication um, is sometimes a very good insight into just exactly what's going on to get the entire picture of that per person's medical history. So just a tip. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that you can look at doing that wound assessment is using this measure mnemonic that Dr. David Keese from London came up with. And it's looking at measuring the wound, measuring the length by the width, looking at the depth and calculating the area. And can I just um, ask if people would put in the chat how they do measure a wound? Do they use the head to toe method or do they use the longest length by the widest width? And Erin, if you can monitor that for me, just uh, pop it in the chat. So we've got one head to toe. Head to toe? Lots of head to toe? Just one. Okay, anybody else measure wounds any, any other way? Do you use uh, pictures? Do you use tracings? Are you having a hard time finding your wound rulers? What I've, yeah, anything else, Erin, before? Um, so tracings, pictures, longest length and width, length slash width and tracing, longest length, length by width. So there was two of those, a couple tracings, pictures. Okay, so the, the, the pictures are helpful, especially if um, you can share those pictures with the individual that has the wound, because it helps them to uh, keep participating in the plan of care if they can see uh, progress happening. Mm -hmm. Kind of how you measure that wound, it's an inexact science, but however you do it, if it's consistent across the area where you work is very helpful. Um, the one problem with using the head to toe measurement is how, if you have a wound on a foot, how do you determine where the head is? And that needs to be very clearly documented so that everybody's doing the same thing uh, and placing the head in the same spot across your work environment, if everyone's doing it the same way, the most common way to do it is measuring the longest length uh, and taking the width at a 90 degree angle to that uh, longest length and then multiplying it and it will give you the area. You wanna know what the exudate is, what, what is the quality of it? Is it serous, is it sanguinous, is it serosanguinous, is it pus? And you want to know 
um, the quality of it. And so that's the quality and then the quantity. But measuring exudate is tricky because nurses are innate um, people who want to preserve and be as cost efficient as they possibly can. So they'll maybe put a dressing on that is not large enough to manage the exudate. So when you take that dressing off, it's saturated. But if the dress, so the dressing becomes then 100% saturated, which means it's a large amount of exudate, when in fact, if there was an appropriate size dressing on that wound, it may have only been 75 or 50% saturated. So it makes a difference. So please, when you're choosing a dressing, choose the appropriate size. It should overlap the wound by one to two centimeters at least. You want to look at, the A stands for appearance, so you want to look at that wound bed. What is the tissue type in that wound bed, including the amount of that tissue type? So is it 50% granulation tissue and 50% slough? Is it 100% necrotic tissue? You want to record that. One of the things that we um, are doing better at is looking at the suffering or the pain the individual is experiencing. What type of pain it is, is a neuropathic pain? Um, is it, uh, what, what is the pain level? And a lot of uh, places are using validated tools now. And I don't know whether any of you are using a, a pain score uh, so that you have consistency again. Uh, the numeric rating score is one that is very easy to use. The FACI score helps um, not the old and the young to determine what it is. But again, using that um, same tool throughout your workplace really helps. When you're looking at that wound, are the edges attached or is there undermining? Uh, and uh, when you have undermining, again, very typically use the faces of the clock uh, to determine where that undermining is. Reevaluation is so important, and I think we do that with every dressing change that we do. And uh, I know, Erin, in, um, in your community, sometimes dressing changes are not always done on regular intervals, um, but you can reevaluate as you go. And looking at the edge of that wound, is it um, a cliff-like edge or is it that sandy beach, uh, very gradual edge? Because we know that um, cells won't migrate up cliffs or down cliffs. Uh, if you have a cliff edge, you will get that rolled border. And you want to know, as someone uh, very aptly observed, what that surrounding skin is like. Is it red? Is it dry? Are there other areas of breakdown? So this tool, uh, David, is very uh, welcoming for you to share if it helps for you to make sure that you're doing that assessment. And, and one can of I add a couple. Can I add a sure. couple things before you move on? Yeah. Um, want to just to back? say, sure. There are there are lots of different tools out there and for different um, situations. So this is one example that we've given and one that I like, but um, there are other assessment tools out there that have been validated. I wanted to add with the Exudate, one thing that I tend to do, if somebody comes in like with a dressing on and I'm changing the dressing because sometimes people come, you know, with the wound open to air, but um, if I can see that old dressing, and ask like, how long has that dressing been on there? And then see how much exudate has gone into that dressing. That's a good way of getting a sense of like how much exudate is actually happening over like a 24 hour period or a 48 hour period. Um, with the undermining, I just wanted to add tunneling as well. Cause certainly I think we see that um, with um, in particular um, folks who have abscesses or complex abscesses. And for the pain, I mean, this is such a big one because I think we all know that a lot of the folks that we work with, um, when they're seeking care outside of a harm reduction friendly setting, um, their pain is often um, dismissed. So I think as much as we can, can chart somebody's pain level and um, be making a note of that, I think that's really helpful for folks in terms of helping them to advocate um, for pain management. Um, 
because we know we know that the folks that we work with um, often are dismissed when it comes to pain. That's what I wanted to add. <laughs> No, those those are good comments, Aaron, and and I think that that pain, um, you know, that wound that we showed you. Do you think that's painful? And that's one of the things that you need to you need to consider, and not only with the folks that you work with, Aaron, but um, it it a, a lot of the uh, way people will report pain you will get people that think that pain is part of the issue and they should just suck it up and suffer it. Uh, or it may not be uh, within their culture and custom to complain about pain. So you really need to, to develop that relationship with that individual so that they are they feel that they can trust you to share that information and that you're not going to judge them. Uh, it it's um it pain is a very uh, subjective um, issue to deal with and uh, getting people talking about their pain unless you intentionally hurt them uh, as they sometimes don't say anything and and we don't intentionally hurt people but how many of you have actually seen someone with a swollen leg uh, very edematous leg and you push on it and leave your fingerprint in there and you see the person wince and you say to them, oh, did that hurt? And they say yes. And then you do it again, just because you want to make sure you're getting the same indentation. I mean, um, we, we do things like that. So we need to be uh, aware of the pain. And as we'll see later with the Nerds and Stonies, pain does matter in a way that has been validated. Pain does matter. But anyway, sorry. Yes. Back That's on track. Okay. Yeah, um, you can hardly tell that we we have a, a combined combination um, enthusiasm here. One of the things that we need to remember, and and Aaron alluded to this when we started, is that that wound is on a person, and that person is within an environment, and that environment is within the a system. So you need to look at the, the total picture of the individual with the wound. You just can't look at, as Aaron said, the hole in the person. And not all um, chronic wounds um, are the same. There are varying causes. Aaron, do you want to speak about the venous stasis? I do. So I think it's good for us to remember in our work that there are some um, kind of common and predictable um, types of chronic wounds. And uh, so, for example, this isn't like everything, but it is a sampling. Um, so folks with diabetes, if they have had... Um, you know, exposure to high blood sugars for long periods of time, and they have um, damage to the microvessels and maybe have and have neuropathy, um, will be more prone to developing um, what are called neuropathic foot ulcers. Um, so that's the picture on the bottom right, of course. Well, I mean, if that's the foot. So um, if you're working with somebody who has diabetes, it's really important to be looking at their feet and um, keeping a close eye on that and understanding that um, high blood sugars can be a risk factor for developing chronic wounds. Um, and venous stasis. So this is like always the bee in my bonnet. And I think Bernadette will attest to this. I'm like always talking about it. Um, but I think a lot of those lower leg wounds that we see in folks, um, I think we need to be thinking like, is there venous insufficiency happening here? Because once those wounds develop, and they can develop for whatever reason, like an injury, like um, could be an injection site, could be that they like ran into a coffee table and bumped themselves, could be a minor burn or whatever. But if they have venous insufficiency, that's going to make it much harder for the wound to heal. And I think a lot of the lower leg wounds that I see in my practice, the, the chronic ones, I'm like, oh man, I wish I could get this person into compression. So um, venous stasis is another common cause of chronic wounds. And Pat, can you talk about vasculitis? Yes, but before I do that, I just wanted, we purposely called this a neuropathic foot ulcer because there are other reasons for people to have neuropathy. 
-hmm. not just diabetes. And I have encountered over my years in, in practice where people walk in to the, I worked in a clinic and people would walk into the clinic and uh, take their shoe and sock off and you would see this wound. And the first thing they would say to me is I am not diabetic. So you have to really try and figure out uh, what is happening. The person may know it may be a B12 deficiency. <laughs> Excuse me. It may be other reasons why there's neuropathy there. Uh, so please um, be careful that you're not labeling everybody with a wound on their foot as having diabetes. And the other piece about this uh, actual picture is that that toe is very stiff. So they are not getting any good push off all of the weight. There's no bend to the toe. So all of the weight when that person takes a step is on that toe. So you can see why it ulcerated. But another common type of wound that you can see is a vasculitis. The most common type of vasculitis is a livadoid vasculitis. Uh, and this happens when um, the there's um, plaque happening on the, the vessel walls. And you start out with these uh, small little um, areas that you can see here that eventually break down and they're actually areas of necrosis. And in person, they, they look like crusting, but they're not, they're actual areas and they will break down. The other piece that can happen when it's not a vasculitis, when it's not an inflammation of those vessels is you can get a vasculopathy and there's a, a thrombosis that forms within those vessels, be they, oh, sorry, I should say that vasculitis can affect all um, size of blood vessels and it can affect all organs of the body. Where vasculopathy happens when there's a thrombos happens in the vessels and uh, vasculopathy is what you see very commonly associated with um, some of the drugs that are out there. So, but it presents with this purpura and this crusting and some of the purpura can be palpable. You can feel it, it's elevated and some of the purpura isn't. So just be aware that, that this is one of the inflammatory processes that can cause chronic wounds. And when we talk about drugs, there are a number of drugs out there that will either delay healing or have a side effect of creating wounds. Hydroxyrhea, one of the uh, main side effects is um, venous light ulcers. So a methotrexate will delay healing. Erin, uh, you want to add anything to the list here? Do you want to talk about xylazine at this point or in a bit? In a bit, but I would just point out that xylazine is on that list as one of many, many me medications yeah. or pharmaceuticals that can affect so you want, formation. You want to know uh, why the drug is being used. Is it disease specific? Um, is it is the source a controlled source or a non-controlled source? Uh, is it being used as directed by a healthcare professional? How are they using it? Uh, is it topical oral IV? What is the risk of taking the drug for developing or delaying wound healing as opposed to the benefit of taking the drug? And, and this is not drug related, but I, I very often use the risk benefit when talking about developing a pressure, pressure injury. If someone needs to be at a 90 degree level, um, 90 degree incline in order to breathe, they have a greater risk of developing a pressure injury. If they are at, if the elevation, the back elevation is less than 30 degrees, uh, they're less likely to develop a pressure injury. My question is, is it better to have a pressure injury and keep breathing or not develop a pressure injury and not be able to breathe? That's a very simplified risk versus benefit, but I think we all need to talk about that. So the bubble that we have here is you really need to know the side effects of the drugs, that some drugs will create or can have that side effect of causing wounds, 
and some drugs may be delayed healing. And again, you may be able to stop one of these drugs for a short period of time to get that wound moving towards a healing trajectory, but you may not be able to. So you need to work your plan of care around that. Anything else, Erin, you wanted to add? No, because I think we're going right into. Yep, we are. Silence. So I know this is what everybody wants to talk about. It's been like the hot topic, um, I guess for a minute now. Um, so, and all this article came out very recently, the reducing the harms of xylazine. Um, and I highly recommend it. It has a good overview of some different interventions. And I think what we do know, um, xylazine, uh, from the monograph, uh, creates, um, oh, I'm having word finding issues. Pat was sort of looking for. Um, what are you looking for? Constriction? Yes. Because it will you. lower, it yes, will lower blood pressure and yeah. Yes. So um, that we expect that effect. Um, in all of the articles I've read about xylazine related wounds, they say the mechanism of action in wound formation is not fully understood. And there's these recommendations for more, um, you know, more research on that particular aspect of it. Um, but we do know that these wounds respond well to, to wound care that follows the basic principles of wound care. So let us not get like so alarmed um, by this. Our, our basic principles of wound care, our good wound care that we're doing um, is going to be able to address um, xylazine related wounds. A thing that I thought was really interesting from this particular article was they were talking about the about the prolonged sedation effect, which um, definitely I see in my practice, um, just related to the increase in benzodiazepines um, in the fentanyl supply, this prolonged sedation. And so this thing about repos repositioning folks to reduce the risk of pressure injury, um, but also to reduce the risk of compartment syndrome, which can lead to some fairly significant like surgical interventions and um, lengthy wound care after that. Um, I thought that was a really cool uh, harm reduction sort of suggestion that was made in this article. And Robin just added, is this the paper? And then, okay. Um, and then Rebecca, I think, had provided two other sources that are coming out. A lot of the research is being done in the States. Um, but I encourage us all to in our own practices to find common language for des describing wounds that we think are associated with xylazine um, so that we can have a common way of talking about it because it seems all very vague in in sort of the context of you know Toronto where I'm working um, so I'm really just encouraging everybody to use that more like have that common language be describing things very specifically like how are things presenting um, I know people are describing necrosis as a, as a factor here, um, but locations of the wounds, um, any kind of details that we can have to kind of come together and have more, more of a common language, common understanding of what kind of the process is happening related to xylazine. And I think, Erin, it, it behooves all of us to really understand um, where the individuals are sourcing their um, supplies from. Um, because certainly if they're sourcing their supplies from a, a safe supply a place, they're not as apt to be exposed to this mixture in the drug. Uh, and again, that comes back to getting that good history and really trying to figure out just exactly what's going on because it will help you uh, determine what's causing this wound. And the xylazine may not be the only issue. There may be other issues going on there, but it may not be helping the situation. And if they're getting their drugs from, um, what did we call it on the slide? Uh, uh, if they're not, if they're getting their drugs from the street, then you really, as a practitioner, do not have control over that. So you need to do the best that you can. And practicing good principles of wound care is where you can go from there. And so that is 
we're safe supply is a way of treating the cause here because we know exactly what is in those pharmaceuticals that we're giving to folks. Um, and also thinking about, um, about those other potential risk factors for chronic wound development that may complicate the healing of xylazine related wounds. So if somebody is having xylazine related wounds on their lower legs and they have venous insufficiency, then you could maybe predict that there's gonna be a longer course of healing that'll take place um, because of that underlying venous insufficiency. We should move on, I think. Yes. Go ahead. Oh yeah. Just to review, and I think um, this won't be new information for everybody, but always good to review. So wounds and infections, we have the pathogen, we have the host, and we have the proliferation, and that's how we get our infections. And the host factors and the person's immune system in this um, instance are really important factors in how um, infections develop and how they progress. So we we know that folks, when they're immunocompromised, are not able to fight off infection in the same way. So that's maybe somebody who has HIV with a low CD4 count. But we also know that nutrition or food insecurity is a huge issue. And we also know that when people are exhausted, their immune systems are very run down. So we're thinking about all of those host factors in the context of wounds and infections and what as well. Um, and also thinking about how it's that same process. So um, we see infections in wounds, but we also see infections moving into the heart and folks have infected other carditis or septic arthritis. Um, there's a lot of different sequelae that can happen as a result of introducing bacteria into, um, into any body, but especially concerning if it's a body that's run down for any reason. And that's a lot of the folks that we do deal with. Life. That applies to everybody, not just yeah. your own clientele. <laughs> yes. Sorry, I'm having... Sorry, Aaron, were you going to say something? No, I'm just going to mute because it's very loud out here. Okay. So one of the ways of looking at whether infection is superficial or whether it is more systemic or de uh, deep is um, uh, using the NERDS and STONY criteria. And this was developed by Dr. Gary Sibold and has been validated. So if you're looking at superficial infection, you have a wound that's non-healing, you have a, a significant amount of exudate, the tissue may be red and bleeding, so it may be friable. There will be degree, debris in the wound so that it will have slough in it. It won't be nice, healthy granulation tissue. And there will be an odor to it. And just to digress a bit, um, all wounds have some odor to them. And wounds that have dressings on them, when you take that dressing off, there will be an odor because it's been covered up for a length of time. Um, if after you've cleansed the wound, the odor is still present, then you need to address that. Unfortunately, there are no common definitions for odor. Although if any of you have smelt Pseudomonas, you will not forget it. It's sweet and uh, it has a very distinctive odor as does staff and strep. Uh, it has a very, they have very unpleasant odors because of the necrotic uh, tissue in the cell breakdown that's there. But if you have any um, three of these, then you're probably dealing with a superficial infection. To identify a deeper infection, you have a wound that's increased in size. The temperature has increased and amongst the chronic wound care world, they're using infrared thermometry to look at temperature. And if there's a uh, greater than a three degree, uh, three degree increase in size from a um, contralateral area, then probably there's something going on there. Uh, if it probes to bone or if there's exposed bone, that's one of the criteria. If there are new areas of breakdown, again, you see the exudate is there. If there's erythema greater than two centimeters around the wound, if there's edema and if the smell is present, any one of those, any three of those would indicate a deep infection. 
And as Aaron mentioned previously, um, Sue Gardner from England did a study where she looked at uh, pain associated with infection. And 100% of the people that she uh, looked at in her, her small study uh, reported an increase in pain with infection. So what's happened is that if you have two symptoms plus increased pain in either of these, then that is determined to be uh, infection. There are other uh, ways of ways to remember to deal with uh, to to uh, indicate infection that have been validated out there, but this is the one of the ones that that we have tended to use. Uh, can you just um, clarify and specify what you mean by like treat? Uh like superficial infection that you would treat topically and so, deeper yeah, infection so, that you would treat systemically. So treating systemically is oral or IV antibiotics. Treating topically is with your local wound care. So using your silvers, uh, using your antimicrobials, your silvers, your uh, uh, povidone iodines, uh, your uh, honey kind of things. Uh, hang on, uh, my husband is just after me here. Go ahead, Aaron. I yeah. the slides. I do think it's a good thing to think about because I think sometimes we see something we're like, oh my God, that needs oral antibiotics. And yes, sometimes it does. And sometimes we can manage things um, with the local wound care. So I find the Nerds and Stonies tool super helpful in helping me to... Um, to to decide like what is the next step that you need to take here and what what is what is this wound and the history telling me about um about what the treatment needs to be um at this time um and i think you know of course not all skin and wound infections are caused by drugs and or injecting and um this particular um human and hit the wound that he had it always reminds me of this um and i'm sorry i'm i'm having a lot of background noise so please excuse me if you hear some yelling um the you can see from this um from this wound that there has been some healing there has been some wound closure that's happened so there was a, a point in time in which the open area was quite large um and we would close the open area it would open again we close it it would open again and we would often find this like sort of small area of purulence would, would reemerge even after the wound had generally closed. And one of the things that I did here was probe um, the wound because it was quite deep and it was tunneling. So um, I think I got about, sorry, I'm just looking, you know, a fair bit, like maybe, six centimeters six or seven centimeters this was probing um and if you don't um you know those q-tips that come in the sterile packaging it's like two per package well they're not q-tips because that's a brand name i shouldn't say that but you know what i'm talking about um in order to probe this i use the not the cotton end but the other end to see how deep it was going because this is information that we need and what i felt at the end of that probe was surgical hardware. Um, and so it was an important clue or important, important indication to me that, oh, I think there's actually an osteomyelitis going on here. And that was the case. Um, but this particular person, he would keep going in and out of hospital with, you know, this, this skin issue and kind of get prescribed like a seven day course of antibiotics and then get, um, get, you know, kicked out of hospital again. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, a few times that he went to the hospital and they actually took a deeper look and they were like, oh, you were in a car accident seven years ago. You had cervical hardware put into your leg. And so you've had this chronic osteomyelitis that's just been kind of um, on a low boil. Um, for you know many years and so that really changes what the treatment is and so I just think this was like a really 
interesting and important learning piece for me um, around really looking at the clues that um, folks are giving you, telling you about their history, what the wound's telling you um, in order to get a more sustained um, and long-term um, effect. There was something else going on with this wound, um, which I will talk about a little bit later. I did wanna say in terms of, Pat, you were talking about the smell and the wound will always smell when you take the dressing off. That also made me think about swabbing. And so if we're swabbing a wound, um, to try to determine antibiotic, potential antibiotic treatment, you also have to clean the wound before you do the swab. So I think that's general knowledge, but just in case it isn't, I'm leaving that with you here. You have to cleanse it and then you do your swab and you're trying to get some of the juices to come up from the wound bed and that's, that's the sample you want. Um, not whatever, it's just kind of on the wound bed when you take the dressing off. You want to swab from the, the cleanest part of the wound that you can find. Now with this one, um, I because of the pus coming out of there, uh, I'm sure that you would harvest a lot of pus uh, if you were swabbing it, yes. Yeah. yeah. So we're, go ahead. We're back to, we're back to this. And Priya, I'm not ready for you quite yet. Yeah. But can folks tell me some ideas for what their local wound care would be? Um, half, uh, anyone? So we know that we have this, um, it looks to me like it's a hard, a hard scar sloth. How would we soften that up? Any ideas? What do people use? What do people like to use? There's no wrong answer. Brenda, enzymatic department. Yeah. Sam, wet dressing. Happy is saying back to grass with a chlorhexidine impregnated gauze. <laughs> Iodazor, yeah. I know my community nurses love Iodazor. So my question to my question to you about iodosorb, do you think there's enough moisture coming from that wound to activate it? What are you seeing, Aaron? It looks dry to me. And I also wonder, um, that's a good question for any time you want to use something that's silver impregnated as well, right? Because with any kind of silver product, you also need there to be moisture to activate the silver. So if it's a dry wound already, silver might not, might not be the choice. No one has, no one has uh, put my favorite, my favorite go-to dressing of all time. What's that? Is, well, it's the um, Covidone iodine impregnated gauze is my is my favorite go to. But yeah, I think folks have got the idea. <laughs> and the, thank you, Zoe, for saying the brand name. Yeah, that's that is we need to we need to get some moisture. We need to get some debridement, some Bernadette said, said enzymatic debridement. Yeah. Or autolytic debridement. We need to get some moisture coming up to get that sloth off. Unless you are trained and able to do debridement or debridement, but if you are not, there are other options. Are we ready to proceed here? Yeah. And 
remembering the wound, the patient, it also really matters what works for the person and what they're able to tolerate. Um, Povidone iodine can be ouchy for some folks, so it's not the right choice for everybody as much as I love it. And it, it depends on what you have available uh, within your system and how you're working. Uh, it, uh, it, it, not everyone has accessibility, not everyone will show up for regular dressing changes. So it's really important to know that environment and the system uh, yeah. for the individual that you're looking after. Yeah, so it matters how long the dressing is meant to be on for as well. Yeah. So what, you, what you're looking at with this local wound care are numbers four, five, and, or five six, and seven you're, uh, of that wound bed preparation paradigm is the, can you debride that wound? And enzymatic debriding, there's only one in Canada, so we can call it Santal, and it, <laughs> it's on prescription. Um, the other thing that you may find in your community is biological debriders, um, maggots, and they are, um, you know, you don't really want to find them, but they do a nice job at cleaning up a wound. And you need to look and figure out whether this wound has, uh, is infected uh, systemically or locally, or if it's inflamed. And, and sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. And then your local wound care is that moisture management. And I think, uh, I think Rebecca had her hand up. I just wanted to... Did. Yeah, I think she's probably trying to tell us we're running out of time. I know. Can I, I want to interrupt and do a quick poll, if that's okay with folks? It, keep going, yeah. keep going okay. though, Aaron and Pat. And if folks could just answer this uh, multiple choice poll that helps us with stats and all good things to help us keep going, that would be great. So here's the poll. But Pat, keep going. can you go back again one slide? Okay. Because I want to give Priya her moment. Priya, what's the thing that we haven't talked about with this wound? Are you there? The with the previous wound or this one? No, no, with the previous one. Because you were, you had an idea about the etiology. Yes. So um can I tell you what I think it is? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. So with the uh with the location, you said lower leg, as well as with the irregular shape of the wound, um, a little bit of drainage, and it looks like it's like kind of dry and not well vasculated in the peri wound area. I would say my first guess would be a venous leg ulcer. For the win, of course. Yeah, yeah. So with all of this local wound care, we're talking about like ultimately it needs compression. If you have a venous leg yeah. ulcer, you need to compress it. Um, and that can be kind of high barrier for the folks that I work with. Um, you know, you need to get vascular studies done. You need to get the APPI done in order to get somebody into a higher level of compression, like, um, how do I say that with the, the brand names, Pat? <laughs> I'm thinking of the C word, the co, the co band. Well, the, uh, the layered bandages or, yeah. Yeah. Multi-layered bandages. But there are lower barrier, um, lower to mid-level compression that are a bit more, um, uh, low barrier for us to do in the community as nurses. So, um, What's my generic word for? So there are um, <laughs> tubular bandages. That's uh, it. Yes. And as one of the modes of tubular bandages, they have a circular compression and another tubular bandage has longitudinal compression. So um, it it depends on what you have out there. There. There is only one brand of longitudinal compression, but there are multiple brand names for the circular compression. And at the end of the day, some compression is better than no compression. And in fact, with the gentleman with the kind of um, the purulent um, drainage where I was doing the probing, um, getting him into some light to medium compression actually made a huge difference for wound closure for him. And he actually liked it. Not everybody likes compression, but he was into it. So it worked out really well um, because there was some venous stasis happening um, in his lower leg as well. And yeah, for, so all, the, for yeah. all the people that are on this call, we're at high risk for developing venous stasis ulceration. So 
wearing compression as a, a preventative measure is a good idea. Yeah, all my nurses get compression socks. Um, and the next slide, because we'll wrap up here. Why is this making me cry? If if you've seen me present this slide before, you already know. Brenda probably knows, but maybe lots of people know. Uh, Rebecca, is it possible to take the poll down? Or I guess we could move it up out of the way. Okay, got it. Is it down? No, it's still up. Um, I'm gonna hit the stop, yeah. So Pat, can you press forward again so we can see? This is just my whole point about moisture management and how it is so important. So this person, this was like fresh after an incision and drainage. So I can understand, I can understand why the, the emerge department put on that calcium alginate. It helps with hemostasis. I get it. That's fine. They put a tegaderm on top of it, which is just like very occlusive. So, so that's my thing. Moisture management, you really don't want to be occluding something that's um, purulent. Um, <laughs> And uh, I think we use this like film dressing way too free and loose sometimes in community settings. They definitely use it too free and loose in eMERGE settings. Um, but just thinking about that moisture balance piece, that moisture management um, and how important that is to maintaining skin integrity. Okay, here's the tools and resources. I do wanna give a shout out again to, um, Dupree because the NSWAC, um, yes, I put it there, the harm reduction community of practice. I think the next meeting is tomorrow night. So I believe if you email this office at nswac.ca, they can send you the link. Um, so that's a very cool new resource um, that's happening. Also, we have, um, there's a resource um, for uh, wound care in resource limited settings. So if you are working somewhere where you don't have a big budget for wound care, this resource was specifically put together for resource limited settings. Um, also the Katie Stop tool is like hot off the press as well. And it's a really good resource to give to folks so that they can help um, monitor their own signs and symptoms of infection. And I would also direct people to um, Wounds Canada has a like managing your own wounds step by step guide that's really good to give to folks if they're doing their own dressing changes. Um, the other thing, Erin, that we did not put in here is the Wound Infection Institute. Uh, you can certainly mm -hmm. join the um, International Wound Infection Institute. There is no fee for membership but they do uh, regularly update their guidelines for treating infection and they've just done so. So there's a, a brand new one out there that you can readily access if you want to learn more about um, what is considered infection in chronic wounds. And then Rebecca, you had a couple of articles that you shared with us right at the beginning. Are you able to pop those links? Yeah, into the uh, chat. already. I can put them in again, but we'll okay. also post them on the website with the video and all the resources that you have. We're going to get those and, and post them there as well. Perfect. These are just pictures. Erin, this is your introductory guide from BC. Oh, yeah. This is, a, this is like a classic at this point, but a good one. And I know we're at time. Oh, we always get talking. I think it's more my fault this time than Pat's. Pat was better on time. Um, but I'm happy to take questions or comments if anyone would like to connect further. But also, I've left our email addresses here. Um, we do both really enjoy talking about wounds. So feel free to drop this line anytime as well. I'm imagining yeah. like Thanksgiving dinner or whatever at your house. <laughs> 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 your family gets together. And you or, 
we're pretty good. We we don't get into it um, very very much with family. But <laughs> Are there any comments or questions in the the chat, Erin? People say, are saying thanks so much. There was a question about uh, frostbite earlier up. Um, oh. any the tricks for avoid, for supporting folks who avoid hospital or clinic um, for cold related injury frostbite. I don't have any uh, tips and tricks. It, it it prevention is is the biggest piece, but that's also very difficult to do uh, if people don't have the the means to stay warm. Um, yeah, I think we're always, you know, trying to get skin back to, you know, its normal temperature, providing a space for that. Um, yeah, providing the space and the means to warm up. Like that's our, that's our primary intervention. If there's- And there was uh, another question before, and I don't know if this person is still on here, but about chronic wounds and people who use crystal meth. And my only comp, I was kind of thinking about that. And I think, um, again, it goes back to this thing around like nutrition, hydration and exhaustion. Um, that, you know, if you haven't slept in days, if you haven't been, you know, able to drink water, or if you haven't been eating, these are all things that are going to make it really easy for your skin to break down and make it hard for your skin to heal. So um, in working with folks who use crystal, I think that's the main thing that I see is, is that exhaustion and that, you know, just lack of hydration and nourishment. That's what's getting to them when it comes to their skin health and, and you know, other things. Um, but I think being able to provide like a space for people to take a nap, to have a snack and to drink some water goes a long way. For so many reasons, or so, mm -hmm. so many benefits, right? Yeah. Well, the determinants of health are for all of us are are so important. If we don't have them, um, that then we can't be healthy. It it doesn't matter what your situation is. So, yeah. I'm going to um, jump myself into uh, just to give another like tip for crystal meth wounds. Oftentimes people have picking associated with it. And a lot of times it can be because the skin is dry or itchy. So sometimes treating the skin integrity can end up helping with the wound care management as well. So, and, and sometimes like a mentholated cream project that has a product that has that cooling sensation can be really helpful to people who are feeling that like itchy, crawly skin kind of discomfort uh, associated with stimulants. 100%, like a really, really good moisturizer, Vaseline. Yeah, love it. Keep some moisturizer in, in the fridge mm -hmm. so that it's, it's cold going on. Yeah, yeah. Good tip. I love a good olive oil out of the shower. It's cheap, it's cheerful, and it's like not a not something that a lot of people tend to have like skin reactions to. Vaseline makes me break out in like hives. So I'm always looking for something <laughs> that doesn't end up like being too thick on my skin. But yeah, olive yeah. oil is a great one. Yeah. I love this tip. Thanks, All right, Bernadette. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, Bernadette. And of course, Aaron and Pat, thank you both so much. This has been great. And I'm excited that we can add this, um, this webinar to our, uh, our library of amazing resources. Um, so yeah, thank you both very much. Thank you. <laughs> all right. That's all. I guess that's, uh, that's all for today. And our next, um,